Bienvenidas y bienvenidos a un programa más de Palabra de Mujer. Hoy contamos con la presencia de la activista y filósofa Judith Butler, eh, profesora titular de la Cátedra Maxine Elliott en la Universidad de Berkeley, en California. Es un honor para nosotros eh, tenerla, tenerla acá, profesora Butler. Eh, quisiera comenzar preguntando acerca de su método, la importancia del método en su teoría feminista. Eh, ¿Considera usted que posee una metodología determinada a su trabajo? ¿Hay un, un procedimiento metodológico que se replique a lo largo de su obra? Um, well, it is true, I probably do not have a methodology. Um, uh, I don't know if I'm against methodology. Um, I think rather that I work um, between philosophy and uh, literary theory. And uh, what I bring from literary theory is a reading practice. Mm -hmm. So for me, it is more important to find a reading practice that works with a particular text mm -hmm. or with a particular cultural set of objects or a political institution. Um, how, how to read is my question, not mm -hmm. what method to use. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, I think some people who use methods um, decide on their method and then they apply it mm -hmm. to their object but I feel like that's insensitive the, to the object mm -hmm. in a way you have to be more open to the question of what what needs what kind of reading needs to happen in relationship to this problem mm -hmm. um, what is the dominant discourse how is it constructing the object how do I read how the dominant discourse works what does it exclude what does it produce so I think that uh, for me, I'm, I'm constantly reading dominant discourses and seeing how they construct their objects and wondering how we might reread uh, those practices so that we can uh, construe the world uh, a bit differently. Esto es particularmente notorio en, su, en sus aproximaciones a la filosofía. Por ejemplo, su lectura de Hegel o su lectura de Freud, por ejemplo. Eh, ¿Cree usted que hacer ese tipo de lecturas es necesario para que la filosofía siga siendo un discurso vigente, importante, socialmente hablando? Um, sometimes the work I do, uh, um, the readings I provide of philosophical texts, even classic texts like the Hegelian ones, have some relationship to um, social and political reality in our time. Sometimes not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not at all. Sometimes I just love being inside the philosophical text and working with a problem. Uh, if it resonates with something contemporary, great. Um, if it doesn't, it's okay with me. <laughs> I, not all of my life is mm -hmm. about bringing philosophy to bear on social and political events. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm working on philosophy, sometimes I'm working on literary texts or films. Um, without immediately making that connection. Mm -hmm. So I, I do not seek to be continuous or uh, integrated as a, as a thinker in that way. Y, as, y con respecto a la escritura, eh, usted no se refiere mucho al acto de la, de la escritura. Eh, podría uno suponer que en su escritura el cuerpo tiene una importancia, una relevancia particular. Eh, pero ¿cómo entiende el acto de escritura? ¿Qué, qué podría decir sobre el acto de, de escribir teoría? You know, um, uh, let me give you a, a roundabout way of answering. <laughs> um, we could um, ask the question, uh, why would people read Hegel now? Why would people read Freud now? These are old texts written by men who are gone. Um, uh, why, why return to those old texts? But I think, in fact, um, those texts can live in the present, um, depending on the kind of reading that we give them. In other words, um, uh, we read now um, according to protocols of reading that are new. They've been developed, perhaps through post-structuralism, perhaps through other um, theoretical operations. We, we learn how to read in, in new ways. 
the question is how can Hegel be made new for, or how can Hegel be made living for us now? How can Freud be made living for us now? So for instance, there are queer readings of Freud. I think of my friend Lee Edelman. He, he has beautiful queer readings of Freud, right? Now they are, they're not historically correct in the sense that Freud would not have accepted what Lee Edelman says, but that's okay. We don't need Freud to accept. We don't even need the traditional Freudians to accept. We need to see what is useful, what can be animated in our present lives, given how we think now, how we read now. So reading is a way of reanimating texts for the present. Um, and for me, that's extremely important. How can a text be made living for us now? You, you ask about the body. Um, there are some feminists who believe we need to write in an embodied way, expressing our desire, letting the body reveal itself in language. I don't know anything about that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I, 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 uh, when they were handing out the feminine essence, I was in the wrong line. Okay, I don't know if you understand my joke, but... Um, uh, I mean, I think I have an embodied way of writing, but people don't recognize that as embodied. Why? Because probably it's not a traditionally feminine one. That means they need to think a little bit more about what the body might be or what its possibilities are. Um, I do think um, that there are ways of writing and ways of doing philosophy that believe um, or that take as a premise that we abstract from the body and occupy a position of pure mind. And I think that's a dangerous position because it involves a disavowal of the very conditions of our living. So I suppose um, one question I have is, uh, is whether there's a way of reading that does not disembody the living conditions of embodiment. Quiero eh, hacerle algunas preguntas más sobre el tema de lo corporal. Eh, este concepto de la vulnerabilidad, eh, ¿cree usted que podría tener más resonancia en países periféricos, latinoamericanos, eh, que en países metropolitanos? ¿Cree que adaptar esa teoría de la vulnerabilidad o esa discusión sobre la vulnerabilidad eh, puede enriquecer su teoría si se la piensa desde los países periféricos? Okay. Do you want to um, try to...? Um, how, to what extent uh, thinking about your concept of vulnerability mm. would be affected by applying them from the periphery in terms of peripheral countries Yes. instead of uh, first world countries? Yes. Well, um, let us think a little bit about the periphery because as you know, there is a periphery of the United States, for instance, mm -hmm. there are the un undocumented. The entire um, um, border with uh, Mexico is the periphery. It's, it's not the beltway, it's not Washington, D.C. <laughs> um, um, and um, if we think about, uh, so uh, one question is whether the periphery is always outside the United States, um, or whether it's also inside as well. Uh, because we can ask what, is the, what are the solidarities among native peoples in Canada, in the United States, and in Central and South America. Uh, what, are, what, is, what, is, uh, what is the relationship of indigeneity among all those people in the Americas who are on the periphery of um, of, of urban and metropolitan life, um, or the political centers of politics. Um, similarly, in Europe, um, uh, we can think about the borders there, um, and uh, people who are in refugee camps, for instance, um, uh, in Italy, or Greece, um, or in North Africa, or even in the north of France. Um, they are exceedingly vulnerable and they are having to think about um, how best to gain some enfranchisement, some mobility, some citizenship. 
So I think the periphery happens everywhere. <laughs> uh, everywhere where global capitalism is functioning, everywhere where major state powers are in complicity with global capitalism, there is a periphery that is always being reproduced. We can find it in the Baracas, we can find it in the barrios, we can find it um, uh, in the ghettos, um, uh, we can find it on the borders. So this is extremely important for us to think about. Ta Thai labor. Lab labor, laborers in Thailand, laborers in China, um, they are all suffering ex extreme vulnerability and precarity. So in my mind, I don't want to stay with a simple geopolitical map where we think we know where power is here and it's not here. Power and powerlessness are being reproduced in different ways across the globe and we need a more mobile map of power in order to chart that. Um, I would be very unhappy if I developed an idea of vulnerability which was implicitly first world and tried to impose it on the rest of the world. I don't think so. I think what I'm, I'm trying to do is um, um, track various movements of the precarious throughout the world and learn from their activism, from their forms of solidarity to develop this concept. Uh, uh, I try to subordinate myself to those movements. It's true that theoretically something of my own formation and orientation and North American um, uh, bias is no doubt at work, but I try to check that when I can. Estamos en la segunda parte de esta entrevista con la profesora Judith Butler. Contamos con la presencia de Adriana, nuestra traductora. Eh, vamos a continuar con las eh, preguntas. Mm, quería preguntar en este mismo sentido del problema del cuerpo y la vulnerabilidad. Eh, ¿Hasta qué punto su explicación acerca de la emergencia del sujeto a partir de su lectura de Althusser, eh, Hegel eh, da cuenta de la emergencia de un sujeto que podría eventualmente traslaparse con el concepto de individualidad. En otras palabras, ¿cómo dar cuenta desde ese marco de eh, la emergencia de los sujetos entendidos como colectivos? Mm -hmm. Ok, good question. Um, in my, my early work, when I spoke about the subject, um, uh, many people assumed I was simply talking about the individual. Um, but in fact, when I thought about the subject of gender, I'm imagining a, a social norm that affects many people. So it's not, it can't be reduced to this person, nor can it be reduced to that person. It's more like an interpolation in the Althusserian sense that um, affects any number of people. and where the responses to the interpolation are quite different, right? It's a girl upon birth, child is born. It's a girl is the first moment of producing this gendered subject. <laughs> but that gendered subject can end up not wanting to be a girl or being the wrong kind of girl or um, interpreting what we may call gir girlness in any number of ways. So although the interpolation is somewhat forcible, even obligatory. The hospital makes you put it down, the law <laughs> makes you put it down. Um, uh, usually the law does. There are some laws that allow for some variation. Um, uh, the, the reaction to the interpolation produces cultural diversity, um, gender diversity. Um, but still, um, the question is whether performative acts, that is to say the acts by which we reinterpret and re-embody gender, are those um, which individuals perform. And um, I want to say yes to some degree, but it's very rare that any of us perform a gender in isolation. In other words, we perform with others, we perform for others. There's a, a social scene that makes the performance possible. And we usually are citing or referring to others who have, um, have preceded us and opened the way for us. Uh, uh, sometimes we feel like we are in a, on a frontier, in a, in a wild, uncharted region. Like, is anyone else in the world like me? <laughs> uh, but, um, but 
when we find the other people who might be, or at least who recognize us, those are very important uh, moments of solidarity. And that's where communities can be articulated that support uh, transgender, that support butch, femme, genderqueer, gender non-conforming, uh, intersex people, bisexual people, very often having to figure out who can recognize me, uh, where am I safe, where am I understood, you know. So, you know, I do think there's a, a social conception at work. It is true that in recent years I've become interested in the work of Hannah Arendt precisely because she also has a performative idea of acting. In other words, we act and in acting produce a new reality. But for her, that kind of action is always plural. It, it, it presupposes a plurality. And, um, and we have to be acting in concert in order to produce social and political effects in the world. So no one really acts alone, according to Hannah Arendt. Every, to act at all means to act in concert, which means we are always plural, we are always social, we are always, in fact, potentially political when we act in concert. Um, and this, um, this struck me as an important way of thinking, and it offered a, a collective uh, way. She would not use the word collective because she had this terrible allergy to Marxism. I'm happy to use the word collective, um, but I think she potentially gives us a collective subject of the performative and political act. So that has shifted my position in some ways. Ayer, eh, una niña de 13 años, sí. Soad Nicole Hambustillo, de 13 años, sí. apareció muerta y tirada en las calles, en una de las calles en Honduras, por sí. protestar eh, como parte de un movimiento en contra de algunas políticas del gobierno hondureño. Eh, hay una tensión en ese sentido entre la crítica, el cuerpo crítico que sale a la calle y, y se empodera de, de sí mismo y, eh, y la amenaza que supone la posibilidad de muerte. Eh, ¿Cómo pensar esa tensión para que los cuerpos críticos puedan seguir eh, postulando socialmente sus, sus, sus críticas? Uh -huh. um. Well, of course, there is the pure horror <laughs> at this event, right? I mean, it is horrifying that a 13-year-old girl who dares to express her political views about the government or about the leader of the government uh, should be uh, killed uh, for her views, for her bravery, for her articulation, um, that she should have to pay for her, with her life for speaking the truth as she understands it. So um, uh, my first response, of course, is horror. And then I want to say this. What is dangerous is when people lose the sense of horror. When they say, oh, yes, that's Honduras, or yes, that happens, or she shouldn't have spoken, maybe she deserved it, um, what could we do, right? There are many ways of making horrific killing normal, right? And I, 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 I saw this in, in Mexico where I was visiting recently, um, you know, in the newspapers, the, some of the local people asked about the disappearance of the 43 students, um, now presumed dead. Uh, what do you think? Well, they had it coming or they brought it on themselves. It's, when, these, when this kind of discourse becomes ordinary, when it becomes normalized, when it becomes accepted in the newspaper, the media, everyday life, that means we've lost our sense of horror. We refuse the sense of horror. So on the one hand, I really believe that one has to keep the sense of horror alive. How do you do that? There's a risk. There's the sensationalist uh, media, oh, girl killed, right? And it becomes sensationalist event. There's no analysis, there's no understanding why, there's no moral objection, there's just horrified fascination. So we, we want our horror to lead to ethical and political analysis and intervention, 
but we don't want it to become sensationalized horror, right? It, it seems to me that's a very important distinction. Um, I guess I would also um, just say the following. Uh, you know, I've I've written on the on the the play of Sophocles' Antigone, Antigone, and um, that play starts with um, Creon, the king, um, leaving the body of Polynices, his um, uh, nephew, on the ground, unburied, just uh, exposed on the street. Why does he do that? Well, he doesn't believe that this nephew who opposed him should, um, should be, have a proper burial. But also, what is he doing politically? He's making a spectacle of the death. He's showing everyone else around him that if you defy me, if you are not loyal to me, this is what will happen to you. So what have they done with this 13-year-old girl? They have produced her body as a spectacle that is meant to instill terror in everyone, right? So, and once that happens, once people become effectively terrorized, they will not be able to move forward, they will not be able to speak, they will not be able to say politically what they think is true. They are denied the capacity to exercise the right of speech, the right to free speech, which is a fundamental democratic right. So, on the one hand, we have the, the brutal and horrifying killing of a young girl. On the other hand, we have an attack on democracy. Una última pregunta. Sí. Eh, creo posible reconocer dos flancos de trabajo en su obra. Una primera etapa que está relacionada con la discusión de la violencia de género, eh, más vinculada a la teoría queer, y un segundo momento en el que se interesa por temas geopolíticos, de violencia de Estado. Eh, ¿Hacia dónde va su obra en el futuro? ¿Qué otros tópicos de interés cree que explorará en adelante. ¿Hacia dónde iría su obra? Well, I don't know. Uh, one one topic that interests me greatly is um, public mourning, uh, and um, I believe that even uh, in my earlier work in gender trouble, um, género en disputa. Um, I was concerned um, that there was a general cultural prohibition on mourning the loss of gay lives, especially those who were um, suffering with HIV or who died from AIDS. Um, <clears throat> so this was 25 years ago in the United States, it still remains true all over the world that there are many unacknowledged deaths from AIDS. It's not as if it's an old phenomenon. But at that time, I, I was concerned um, and I thought there must be public mourning. There must be a way of acknowledging these losses, of claiming that these losses are wrong, of making demands for health care that would stop these deaths from happening. and. Um, and many of the forms of activism at the time, including ACT UP, were about insisting on public acts of mourning. Queer Nation, ACT UP, both of those, at least in the United States and, um, and elsewhere, uh, were very important in that way. Um, I think after 9-11, I became aware that the United States would mourn those who were killed in the terrible 9-11 attacks but it would never mourn those it kills. Um, it would never mourn the losses of civilians in Iraq. It would never mourn the, the it wouldn't even mourn, mourn the non-US citizens who were killed in 9-11, right? So there was a hierarchy of mourning. <laughs> who is, who can be mourned publicly, who cannot? Now, um, uh, so this leads me to a kind of broader question of who can be grieved and who can, who is not grieved, who is taken out of the category of the grievable. And uh, my own view is that all lives should be equally grievable, all, which means that all lives are equally valuable 
and all lives should be equally safeguarded and, and, and preserved. And we should work for egalitarian social, political, and economic structures where all lives may be considered and treated as equal. Um, I am interested in the fact that very often acts of public mourning are also acts of public protest. So what is this relationship between the act of demanding public recognition for a loss and protesting the violence that brought about the loss, whether it's state violence, whether it's economic violence, whether it's the violence of the cartel, whether it's the violence of, um, of domestic violence, um, uh, it needs to be named, it needs to be opposed. But I think mourning, naming, and opposing can work together as part of public protest and as part of what we understand as the contemporary tasks of public assembly. Agradecemos profundamente a la profesora Butler, así como a Adriana, eh, por esta segunda parte de la entrevista del, del programa Palabra de Mujer. Eh, síganos por la señal del Canal 15 y hasta pronto.